Right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. I'm Stephanie Sosius, one of the medicine chief residents, and you'll be seeing myself and one of the, or one of the other chiefs throughout our Grand Round series this year. So today we have the opportunity to host our next Robert J. Glazer guest lecturer, Dr. Kevin O'Leary. Um, and in just a moment, we'll have Dr. Mark Williams from the Division of Hospital Medicine introduce Dr. O'Leary. But just to give you a brief background of Dr. Robert Glazer, um, who endowed this, fellow, this uh, lectureship with, uh, from him, he and his wife to kind of promote medical education and scholarship. Dr. Glazer was a, a giant in medicine, science, science and leadership, um, having risen to the, uh, the level of the chief of the division of rheumatology and immunology and really promoted both education and scientific inquiry. So today we are honored to have Dr. O'Leary continue in that tradition with the Robert J. Glazer lecture. So I'll have uh, Dr. Mark Williams give her another brief introduction. Well, good morning. This is a real honor and joy for me to get to introduce a friend um, who I got to meet way back in 2007 um, at a prior uh, employment. Um, Kevin O'Leary um, was uh, leading the hospitals program at Northwestern and we really became partners as we grew the program. And he has grown to become one of the premier leaders um, in the Society of Hospital Medicine. And I think a couple of his awards reflect that. Um, he won the um, Society of Hospital Medicine National Award for Clinical Excellence, and then later on won the National Award for Teamwork and Quality Improvement for the Society of Hospital Medicine, and more recently became a formal master of the Society of Hospital Medicine. I think there's probably only about 25 or so right now in the entire U.S. among the 40,000 plus hospitalists. Um, he's the John T. Clark Professor in Chief for the Division of Hospital Medicine and Associate Chair for quality at the Department of Medicine and also medical director for Northwestern Memorial Hospital in Chicago. Um, and is truly from Illinois, um, went to, uh, is an Illini, went to the University of Illinois at um, Champaign, or Urbana-Champaign, and um, then went to the University of Illinois, uh, Chicago, where he graduated AOA, um, obtained a master's of science in healthcare quality and patient safety from Northwestern and did his residency. Um, at the McGaw Medical Center of Northwestern University. And in addition to his hospital medicine awards, he's also been honored for being a nursing partner and care award at Northwestern, and then won the Lucian Leap Ahead Award from the American Association for Physician Leadership and the John Eisenberg Award for Innovation, Patient Safety and Quality um, at the Joint Commission and uh, National Quality Forum. And you know, these are probably the two most prestigious awards in the nation for patient safety and quality. And then in his spare time, he's been a principal investigator or co-investigator on over $20 million in federal and foundation grants and has more than 100 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters. So I'm really looking forward to continuing to learn from Kevin as I have through my entire career. Thank you, Mark. That, that was uh, very generous. I appreciate that. Um, it's a huge honor for me to be here. I was, I was reading about Dr. Glazer and I really appreciate uh, his career and his generosity in establishing this lectureship and um, looking at the list of individuals who have given this in the past. And it's just, it's an amazing group. So I'm, I'm honored to be part of that group. It was a delight to meet with the hospital medicine faculty yesterday, a really impressive group. Fun to catch up with Mark and Mark Tolke as well. Uh, Mark and I, as, as he mentioned, he was my mentor for many years at Northwestern and we still work very closely together. So I've enjoyed that friendship and, and all the advice and mentorship you've provided over the years. Uh, so the, the talk today is, is entitled Redesigning Systems to Improve Teamwork and Quality for Hospitalized Patients. And for some of you, you probably have an idea of what I'm gonna talk about and others of you might be scratching your head and wondering you know, what this is all about. It, it really is about trying to improve care for hospitalized patients, redesigning systems and improving teamwork with then, with then downstream effects on the quality and safety of, of care for patients. But in case you, you, that doesn't make sense to you, it will very, very soon. So here are my disclosures. I've received past and current research funding in this area from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. And here are our objectives. So we'll explain how collaboration and teamwork influence patient outcomes, We'll then define system barriers to improved teamwork on medical services. There are a lot of barriers 
will describe interventions to improve teamwork in the context of clinical microsystems, redesigning microsystems to address those barriers that we'll describe. We'll summarize preliminary findings and lessons from the RESET study. This is a study that I've been working on for several years. Mark has been working on that with me. And then finally, we'll discuss factors associated with successful implementation of complex interventions to improve interprofessional teamwork. And this is actually probably the most important and most useful part for you. Uh, implementing these changes is very difficult. And I know that you've renewed your efforts and some of the interventions that I'm gonna describe. And really this part I think would be uh, especially useful for you. So uh, if you're a hospitalist or if you're on the mailing list for hospitalist periodicals, you've seen articles like this from the hospitalist, which is a periodical from the Society of Hospital Medicine talking about unit-based rounding. And here's another article talking about unit-based rounding. And here's a bunch of covers from another periodical called Today's Hospitalist. And so there's a lot of attention to things like bedside rounds and unit-based staffing and multidisciplinary rounds and unit-based care. And it, it's a little bit confusing. These things refer to these related interventions, but they're using slightly different terms. And it's not entirely clear in these articles kind of what these interventions are, how they relate to one another and how they actually improve uh, outcomes and, and teamwork. So that's one of my goals is to try to clarify some of this for you. But first let's talk about why collaboration and teamwork matter. And even before we talk about that, I wanna make sure that we're all thinking about the team in the same fashion. So I want you to imagine a patient in your hospital right now in one of your rooms and think about all the people taking care of the patient. In a teaching hospital like yours, there's the resident, the resident works with interns, there's the attending, you probably have some medical students, and this is kind of the core physician team. That's on the teaching service, on the hospital service, there's a hospital physician, an APP, but I like to remind my physician colleagues that there's other people taking care of the patient, the nurse spends much more time with patients than we do, and nurses work with closely aligned team members in our hospital. We call them patient care techs. You may have a similar role uh, in your hospital as well. And then there's a whole bunch of other people taking care of the patient, right? There's physical therapy and respiratory therapy and pharmacists and social workers and consulting physicians, entire teams of consulting physicians. And sometimes the patient leaves their main unit and they go to a diagnostic or procedural area where a different team takes care of them for part of the day and then they come back to their unit. And even if not physically present, the primary care physician from the patient's perspective is definitely an essential member of the team. I want you to take a mental snapshot of this picture because I'm gonna ask you to recall that a little bit later, but there's a couple important points here. First, the team is huge, you can see that. And second, obviously, there's a lot of different types of professionals taking care of the patient. It's important for us to spend some time understanding and improving teamwork because first, we spend a lot of our time on communication related, teamwork related activities. Time motion studies show that nurses and physicians spend about a quarter of the time communicating and coordinating care. Large observational research studies show that hospitals with higher ratings of teamwork have higher nurse retention. That's always been really important, but it's never been more important than it is right now when it's really critical to retain and recruit great nurses. And then again, observational research shows that hospitals that have higher ratings of teamwork also tend to have higher patient satisfaction. But I think the most compelling reason for us to spend some time understanding and improving teamwork is this relationship between communication, which is obviously essential for effective teamwork, and patient safety. There's a, an entire body of literature showing this, but I'm just gonna give you three examples. The first is a study by Kathleen Sutcliffe and colleagues when she was at the University of Michigan. They interviewed residents in various different departments about medical mishaps in which they've recently been involved. And they didn't know what themes would emerge, but the dominant theme by far was communication failure. It was involved in 91% of the mishaps that residents described. The Joint Commission, as you all know, requires us to report sentinel events to them. These are adverse events that result in serious harm. They ask us to do root cause analyses and then report the information to them. They track this information. And over the years, about two thirds of sentinel events have involved communication failure. And then finally at the bottom, again, in a large observational research study, uh, there was a finding that higher ratings of collaboration on the part of nurses are associated with lower risk adjusted mortality. And that's something you're gonna hear me kind of say again and again, that the perspective of nurses 
is really key in all of this. So let's dig a little bit deeper into what teamwork is. There's different uh, frameworks for teamwork. They're all probably more similar than they are different. And many of them are built on this model and the work done by Eduardo Salas and his colleagues at the University of Central Florida. And they studied teams in aviation, the military, later healthcare, and said that there are four, there are five core components of teamwork. The first is team leadership. So team leaders effectively direct team members activities. They assign roles, clarify roles, help resolve conflict. Mutual performance monitoring, that's the ability of team members to monitor what one another are doing and if needed to help them out, to anticipate their needs and provide backup behavior. Adaptability is the ability of the team to adjust its strategies based on new information that's coming in about the team's performance. And then finally, team orientation. That's the practice where team members put the team's goals ahead of their own. It's the, you know, there's no I in team uh, component. Now, when all of these things are working effectively, the team develops a shared mental model. A shared mental model is an organizing knowledge of the tasks of the team and how team members will interact to accomplish those tasks. Sometimes people say this is like uh, being on the same page, reading from the same script. And probably the best way to illustrate this for you is with a picture of a group of individuals who don't share the same mental model. So if you Google shared mental model, this is the funny picture that you'll find. And let me just kind of walk you through this. There's, there's four individuals here on the left that you can see that um, are in hazmat suits. They're focusing their attention on the ground. There's apparently something very toxic and dangerous on the ground. On the far left, there's someone who won't even touch this literally with a 10 foot pole. And then on the right, you see this gentleman who is in a pink polo. His attention is focused on the camera. He thinks this is a photo op. He does not share the same mental model as these other individuals, right? And a shared mental model is important for teams to make sense of their situations and to make better decisions. Another related concept, uh, especially in sense-making, is situational awareness. Situational awareness is the ability of a team to pick up on perceived threats, potential threats to its work. And you can see that here we've got a team of hunters and they're, they, they lack situational awareness of this looming threat in the background. Teams accomplish these things through closed loop communication. So this is an example of communication that's not closed loop that could be occurring in many hospitals right now where there's a physician in one part of the hospital returning a page from a nurse in another part of the hospital and the physician says, page me. And the nurse says, Mr. Jones has more pain. And the physician says, let's increase the hydromorphone to 4Q2. And the nurse says, okay. I, I hope that you realize and, and are you know, appalled because there's a lot wrong with this dialogue. Um, first of all, there's an assumption that we're talking about the same Mr. Jones, but we don't know for sure that they are. Uh, one, also that's a lot of hydromorphone, wow. <laughs> but all the, all the more reason why we should be communicating more clearly, there's, I don't know whether the, there's an assumption that the physician knows why the patient has more pain. I don't know whether the nurse is taking a verbal order here and putting that change in. I don't know whether the physician is putting in the order. Um, I think it's IV hydromorphone, but it, you know, there's a lot that's unclear here. What if it looked like this? Physician is returning a page from a nurse and the physician says, this is Dr. Girardi, I was paged. And Margo, Dr. Margot Girardi, she would do this, right? She understands the importance of closed loop communication. So she identifies herself. The nurse says, Mr. Jones has more pain. Physician wants to clarify that they're talking about the same Mr. Jones and says, Mr. William Jones in 1302 has more pain. The nurse says, correct. Physician says, I just saw him implying, I've assessed him. I understand why he's got more pain. I'm putting in an order for hydromorphone for Q2. So now we know who's putting in the order, but the nurse now picks up and realizes that she needs to to confirm what she's heard. So you're increasing the hydromorphone from two milligrams IV Q2 hours per N to four milligrams IV Q2 hours per N. And the physician says, yes, that's right. Uh, still a lot of hydromorphone, but right? I mean, if this was insulin or an anticoagulant, uh, we, we prescribe a lot of medications that are potentially uh, dangerous at doses that are potentially dangerous, really important for us to get this communication right. But if we're honest, Communication usually doesn't look like this, right? I mean, we, we tend to not use closed loop communication and actually communication doesn't occur at all a good proportion of the time. 
This is information from two studies. Interestingly, one was done here at Barnes many years ago. Um, and then one was done at Northwestern Memorial Hospital when we were first looking into this and kind of characterizing the issue. And very similar approaches. So I've just combined the findings and, and the, the methods were similar. So what we did was we randomly selected patients and then we interviewed the nurse and the physician for the patient in the afternoon. So enough late afternoon. So enough time for communication to occur if it were to occur. And we asked the nurse, do you know the name of the main physician taking care of this patient? Have you communicated with her or him? If so, how did you communicate? And in, I've combined the findings and what, what's been seen is that the nurses know the name of the physician taking care of the patient 40 to 70% of the time. The physicians know the name of the nurse less often, 20 to 40% of the time. More importantly, they report communicating with one another only 50 to 60% of the time. Again, at the end of the day, and two thirds, the, two thirds of the time that's face to face, but a third of the time that's just a phone call or a text page. And what that translates into is a lack of a shared mental model. So in our study, what we also did was we asked the nurse and the physician, we said, what's the main diagnosis that this patient was admitted for? What tests are planned for today? What procedures are planned for today? What medications are planned for today? And we wrote down verbatim what they said, and then we had two physician researchers look at their responses, compare them and rate them as being in complete agreement, partial agreement, or no agreement. And we said, give the benefit of the doubt. If the nurse says the diagnosis is fainting and the physician says syncope, that's the same thing. But even with that flexibility, you can see that there was no agreement between the nurse and physician taking care of patients 26% of the time for diagnosis, 26% of the time for planned tests. And you can see also alarming uh, percentages for planned procedures and medication changes. So that's some of the information that we gathered to try to make the case that we needed to, to work on this. The other thing we did was we surveyed uh, professionals who had been on service recently. So we surveyed hospitalists, residents, nurses, social workers, pharmacists, and we asked them to rate the quality of collaboration that they had experienced with other professional categories and the dyad that's most important is this nurse physician dyad. So I'm showing you that dyad and there's this discrepancy. So what's shown in these uh, uh, bar charts is the percentage of respondents in one category rating the quality of collaboration with the other as high or very high. So on the left on our teaching service, you can see that 72% of residents rated the quality of collaboration with nurses as high or very high, but only 35% of nurses rated the quality of collaboration with residents as high or very high. I'm looking at your faces and I see a few of you kind of nodding, so you're not too surprised by this. Same story on the hospital service, where 70% of hospitalists rated the quality of collaboration with nurses as high or very high, but only 42% of nurses rated the quality of collaboration with hospitalists as high or very high. It, based on your responses, I think you, you're convinced of this, but just in case you're not and think, you know, maybe this is just a Northwestern thing, or you know, this is published in 2010, maybe it's a long time ago, Here's a more recent study that we did as baseline uh, data collection for our RESET study. So four sites in different parts of the US, uh, same thing where you can see that the majority of hospitalists rate the quality of collaboration with nurses as, as good and a minority of nurses feel the collaboration with hospitalists is going well. So why is this? Um, you know, why is this so hard to accomplish and, you know, no one gets up in the morning and says, you know what, teamwork just isn't my thing. I don't think I'm going to communicate effectively today. It's just, you know, I've got other things that I want to prioritize. It's the, the issue is that things get in the way. And so we went back to the work of Eduardo Salas and Lemieux Charles and others, again, who have studied teams in, in a variety of different settings, aviation, military, healthcare. And there's lots of things that get in the way, but there's three things especially. So Large team sizes, sometimes the team is too small, but more often large team sizes get in the way of teamwork. Team membership instability, that means that team members are joining and departing the team as the team is doing its work. And then dispersion of team members, meaning team members are not in the same place at the same time. These were factors that they identified in teams in all settings. But if you think about healthcare, we've got that, right? I mean, think about that picture that I showed you in the beginning with that patient in the middle, the concentric circles and all of the people taking care of the patient, that's a really large team. 
And that's just one moment in time. Because we provide care 24 seven, nurses are ending their shift, new nurses are coming on, we're signing out to night flow, coming back in the morning, et cetera, et cetera. And we've got dispersion in team members. This is almost universal in hospitals, but especially at large hospitals like yours and, and, and mine in the past, where this is what uh, life looked like for me before January of 2008. I might be on service and I could have a patient on 13 West, another patient on 13 West, I could have a patient on 13 East. And in fact, at that time, I could have patients on nine different units on five different floors. And some of those floors were separated by other floors. And it was really hard for me to collaborate with the nurses and the social workers and the pharmacists and some of the other unit-based uh, team members that were kind of you know, closest to the patient. A different hospitalist on at the same time would have an entirely different distribution of patients and the same challenge trying to collaborate with the core kind of unit-based team members. So let's talk about some of the interventions to improve collaboration and teamwork, what has been tried and, and what does the evidence show? Um, there's really kind of four categories of interventions, four main ones. I'm not gonna talk too much about teamwork training. There's actually a, a, a lot of research on teamwork training and systematic reviews have shown that it does improve team performance. There's a small signal for improvement in patient outcomes, but most of this has been done in areas where the team members are already in the same place at the same time. Emergency departments, operating rooms, that's really not the case for us. So we, what our team has worked on is really kind of addressing those system barriers um, first. So I'll talk about geographic localization of physicians, that's one of the interventions, unit-based co-leadership and interprofessional rounds. So I mentioned that this is what life looked like for me before January of 2008. And then beginning in January of 2008, we went to a model that looked like this and it, it still looks like this. Oversimplified, what we did was we assigned a newly admitted patients a bed first, and then that told us what service and physician would take care of the patient. It's obviously much more complicated than that. We met regularly for 12 weeks before we went live with this, with the residency program, with the hospitals program, with the patient throughput department, with the emergency department to help understand logistically how this was gonna work out. But it has worked out and we still have this model. Um, others have also done this. And here's kind of the, the impact of these efforts to localize physicians. There's increased recognition of team members, nurses and physicians, know each other's name more often. I think that's uh, generally a good thing. There's increased frequency of face-to-face -face nurse physician communication. That's a, a, a richer medium of communication, channel of communication than, than others. I think that's a good thing. There's a reduction in pages to physicians. That's nice. But there's not a whole lot of uh, evaluation of other outcomes, including teamwork and, and patient outcomes. But probably most importantly, it provides the foundation for other interventions. And you know that analogy is, I think, really important. It's really hard to build these other interventions without the foundation for um, of localizing physicians. So that's some evidence on, on that specific intervention. Here's some evidence about uh, interprofessional rounds. Um, lots of studies, so I'm just going to share with you some systematic reviews. The first published by Samuel Panic. Uh, interestingly, the, these have different findings. So what he found was that with enhanced interprofessional rounds, there's some evidence to support improved patient safety, but there was no difference in length of stay. Uh, shortly after, uh, Bama Dapati published a, a systematic review that found something different. She found that there was some evidence to support improved length of stay and staff satisfaction, but little data on patient safety or satisfaction. John Rattel at the Mayo Clinic he looked specifically at bedside interprofessional rounds. There's um, a, kind of a group of, a subgroup of people interested in these interventions who really feel strongly that interprofessional rounds should be done at the bedside. And he wanted to see if patient-centered outcomes were improved with this. And he found that there was a small improvement in patient experience, but it was small and there was no improvements in patient comprehension or knowledge. So why these different findings um, from these various different studies of different interventions, I think that there are limitations to these prior efforts. Um, and the main limitation is that these interventions have typically been implemented and evaluated in isolation, meaning localization has been done, but they haven't done anything to 
improve interprofessional rounds or interprofessional rounds have been implemented, but it's not effectively implemented because the physicians are not localized to specific units and can't really attend on a regular basis. It's probably a better idea to think about these interventions and conceptualize them as complementary and mutually reinforcing and that they should be implemented and evaluated as such. And so with that, uh, I wanna tell you about um, the next thing that we did at, at Northwestern Memorial Hospital. We localized our physicians, I said, in January of 2008. And then beginning in January of, of 2020, we implemented a couple of additional interventions that we called this INTERACT project. And this was funded by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. There were two additional interventions that we put into place. The first was unit-based co-leadership. And this involved the creation of a new role for us, a, a unit medical director. We hadn't had that in the past. And we said that the unit medical director and the nurse manager were gonna be jointly responsible for quality on their unit. And we put them through training because this was a new role. We wanted to make sure that they understood each other's role and understood how to work well together. The other thing that they were gonna do was lead the development and then facilitate structured interdisciplinary rounds. SIDR combines structured communication, like a, like a checklist sort of thing, with regular interdisciplinary meetings. The nurse manager and the medical director were going to co-facilitate this. All nurses, physicians, pharmacists, social workers, and case managers were expected to attend. And most importantly, this was developed from a ground-up approach, from a bottom-up approach, where we had frontline nurses, physicians, and others form working groups on the two pilot units where we did this, and they decided the optimal format, frequency, duration, and location, and best use of the communication tool. And what we did was we, we decided to do this in a conference room on the unit. We spent a lot of time talking about doing this at the bedside, and, and we decided not to do that. This is the communication tool that the team came up with. This is used for new patients with the rationale that new patients have a lot going on, a lot of moving parts in their plan. And so the physician comes in uh, kind of in a staggered fashion with all the other team members in the room and talks about for new patients, the overall plan of care for the day, the discharge plans, the patient safety kind of items. Uh, for old patients, we talk about them as well, the patients who haven't been newly admitted, but it's really kind of to the point what's going on today. And this are some, these are our findings. So we had no impact on length of stay and cost. We were disappointed, but our length of stay and cost were actually pretty good uh, before we started this. Professionals rated these interventions favorably. They actually thought this improved the efficiency of their workday and they wanted these interventions to continue, which was really key. The other thing we found was that there were significant improvements in collaboration and teamwork. On the left, you can see that there were two control units where we didn't implement these interventions. Nurses were still relatively dissatisfied with collaboration with physicians. And on the right, you can see that then 76% of nurses were pleased with collaboration and that difference was statistically significant. The other thing we did was we looked for an impact on patient safety. And so I actually had two residents who were doing uh, research blocks and they used the IHI trigger tool, which is a really rigorous medical record review to identify adverse events. And what we found was that on uh, our control unit, there were 7.2 adverse events per 100 patient days. On the intervention unit, with the interventions, there was 3.9 adverse events per 100 patient days, a reduction of 46% in uh, adverse events. We also did a pre-post analysis. So a concurrent control and pre-post analysis had the same findings. So we were thrilled with that. Other people have put together similar kind of multi-component um, models. So one that's really commonly known is called the Accountable Care Unit or ACU model. This was developed by Jason Stein and a closely related one is called Accountable Care Team Model. This was put together by Reba Kara at Indiana University. Um, they both have the same components. So unit-based physician teams, that's just another way of saying localization of physicians to specific units unit level nurse physician co-leadership, which I talked about a little bit, structured interdisciplinary bedside rounds, Jason especially is an, is an advocate of doing rounds at the bedside, and unit level performance reporting, that's uh, data at the unit level about um, quality measures. Uh, Jason hasn't studied these interventions in a really rigorous way. Ariba did a really nice study where she looked at the, the degree of implementation of these components and found that there was an association with improved length of stay and cost. 
uh, but not patient satisfaction. And her study, she didn't look at, at patient safety, but a nice signal that there's an impact. And so what all of these models are doing is they're taking a systems approach, right? They've, they've identify, identified those barriers in the system that I talked about, and they're trying to address them. And really what they're doing is redesigning clinical microsystems. A clinical microsystem is the small group of people who work together in a defined setting on a regular basis to provide care. A hospital unit is a clinical microsystem. Clinical microsystems coexist with other clinical microsystems. So other hospital units, emergency departments are clinical microsystems, ICUs, procedural suites. These are all clinical microsystems. They exist within the meso system of the hospital, which of course is connected to outpatient practices Sometimes multiple practices, and multiple hospitals make up a health system at a macro level. So that brings me to the, the RESET study, which we've been working on for the past four or five years. Um, this was funded through ARC and a collaboration with the Society of Hospital Medicine and importantly, the American Nurses Association as well. And we used these interventions that are going to look really familiar to you just to confuse things. We added another label. Uh, we called it the Advanced and Integrated Microsystems Interventions or AIMS Interventions. Um, Unit-based physician teams, again, that's just localization physician-specific units. Unit co-leadership I've talked about. Enhanced interprofessional rounds means that we worked with the sites in the study to improve their interprofessional rounds, make sure that all the right people were there. They were regularly attended. The conversations looked really great. Uh, Unit-level performance reports I alluded to. And then patient engagement activities we encouraged our sites to do rounds at the bedside, but we didn't require it. And there were a couple of other patient engagement activities that we encouraged them to implement. So we got funding for this in uh, late 2017. We had an open call for applications and collaboration with the Society of Hospital Medicine. We had 14 applications and four, selected four sites based on the fact that the sites didn't already have these things in place. And they had uh, evidence of a, a high level of commitment uh, by the organization. Um, so these are the kind of where the sites are. All of these hospitals are mid-sized hospitals, 250 to 500 beds. Um, two of them are community hospitals, two of them are teaching hospitals, but none of them is a major affiliate of a medical school. And what we did at each of these sites is we asked them to designate a physician and a nurse who are going to be a dyad co-leading implementation of the AIMS interventions at their site. And then we gave them mentorship. We had a nurse and physician mentor team, actually two of them, who would meet with the site leaders monthly to guide them and provide mentorship as they implemented these interventions. The other thing we asked the sites to do was to choose one unit to be kind of the first intervention unit and another one or two units to be a control unit. We also gave them funding for a research nurse to collect some outcome data and also importantly, fidelity of implementation data, meaning we wanted to know how well these interventions were implemented. And each month the mentors would use this to say, how are things going? And they would go over the data to see kind of what things were going well and what things weren't. And I'm gonna get back to that in a little bit. The other thing we did was we gave them a really detailed implementation guide. This is freely available if you're interested in the, on the SHM website and the ARC website. And this describes all of those interventions in detail. It's got lots of references. It describes anticipated barriers to implementation and then strategies as well. Just to complement all those other uh, things that we did to support implementation, we also did two site visits in the first year. We did another site visit in the third year and we had um, group uh, webinars, you know, with all of the sites two to three times a year where they would provide a little update to one another and then get feedback from one another on implementation. So pretty rigorous support for implementation. And here are some of the results. And I will just say that this is unpublished data, but I thought it was important to share it with you, but just, you know, be aware of the fact that this hasn't been submitted uh, or peer reviewed yet. So first, the ratings of collaboration. And as I uh, showed you earlier, at baseline, pre-intervention, the hospitalists, the majority thought the collaboration with nurses was going well. The minority of nurses thought the collaboration with hospitalists was going well. That's what we've seen before in past research. And then with the intervention, the, uh, the percentage of hospitalists rating, rating the quality of collaboration with nurses as high 
went up, but it wasn't statistically significant. But the nurses, the percentage of nurses rating the quality of collaboration with hospitals is higher, very high. That went up and, and the difference was statistically significant. We also look at something called teamwork climate and that also had a statistically significant improvement. That was one of our primary outcomes. The other primary outcome was adverse events. And this slide is really complicated. So I'm gonna ask you to just listen to me rather than look at all the confusing detail on this table. I haven't yet figured out how to simplify this, um, but let me just walk you through what we did. I mentioned that we had research nurses at each of the sites. They did medical record reviews with something called the Medicare Patient Safety Monitoring System. It's an algorithmic, rigorous approach to identify adverse events. And what we did was a controlled before and after study design and a difference in differences analysis. That's a really rigorous method to make sure that there's no other reason why adverse events would change. And what we found, I'm just gonna kind of click through this because the bottom line is pretty simple, is that there was no difference in adverse events. And we were disappointed. And um, there's a lot of potential explanations for that. One is that maybe the interventions don't improve adverse events. But the other thing that we knew would occur, and we measured this, is that the fidelity of implementation was suboptimal and it changed over time. And so I mentioned that we had fidelity of implementation data collected. We reported it out to the sites each month. And just to simplify things, we created kind of a composite fidelity of implementation measure. And I'm showing you that here graphically because I wanna illustrate a couple of things. The first is that for all the sites, it took them a long time to kind of ramp up implementation, right? You can see that it took five, six months for the sites to really get things going. And then it plateaued and, and really never was implementation optimal, uh, even for the best sites that were having success. So the next thing that we're doing um, is trying to use the fidelity of implementation as a predictor variable to see if that's associated with an improvement in the outcomes. So the jury's still out on whether outcomes are improved, I think, with this. And I think in large part, it depends on how well it's implemented. That gets me to this last uh, piece of the reset study that I wanna describe for you in, in some detail, which is um, a, a, about this, you know, what factors affect the success of implementation. We knew that this would be a challenge. And so our aim three for the study was a qualitative data collection and analysis to try to identify factors associated with successful implementation. So we uh, did semi-structured interviews of 44 individuals, across these four sites, including the site leaders, frontline nurses and physicians, and the mentors themselves. And what we found was that these are the four factors associated with success. I'm gonna read these through and then uh, go into some detail. So the first is consistent system support and senior leadership involvement. The second is alignment of reset with system, hospital, and professional group priorities. The third is site leaders engagement and reset and the relationship they had with one another. And the last is variation in frontline buy-in and perceptions of benefit. And the reason why I think this is important is because um, as you have renewed your efforts to implement simple, similar interventions, um, I want you to kind of keep in mind whether you've got these things in place. So this first um, factor, consistent system support and senior leadership involvement, what we mean by that is that all of the senior leaders at these sites verbalized their support, but it was kind of superficial support and really their support wasn't needed until problems arose. So you'll see what I mean by these quotes. The, the physician leader at site C said in a positive way, so the associate CMO and associate CNO have been really involved. They attend a monthly reset team and leadership meeting that we have. And so they've been our executive sponsors. I think we've had really strong support from the C-suite. What was unique about this site who had probably the best success in implementation is that these C-suite members we're actually attending regular meetings with the project leaders. That was unique. Contrast this with the comment here from the physician mentor talking about site B who said, their high level leadership was always in favor of the project, but as we got farther into the project, a recognition of what that means in terms of providing tangible support for some of the things became more apparent, which happened with processes around assignment, uh, signing beds from the ED, admitting for the ED to support localization, supporting the interprofessional rounds, getting folks there, working on the scripts for the interprofessional rounds, all those things. So again, when problems arose, the senior leaders, their superficial knowledge and support just wasn't enough. 
The second factor is alignment of reset with system, hospital, and professional group priorities. And especially this was true when the hospital, hospitalist group had different priorities than the health system and the hospital. So this first quote from a physician mentor talking about site A said, a lot of the problems related to the funding structure, the hospitalist group was contracted as a distinct entity from the health system and had a different employer with a different goals and the hospitalists were in a compensation structure that made it difficult for them to localize from a compensation standpoint, but also resistant to anything that changed the routine. This, there were two uh, hospitals where the hospitalists were heavily incentivized on productivity and really they cared most about generating RVUs and they didn't really want to be bothered with, with the interventions related to reset or any other quality improvement. This last uh, one on this, on this uh, slide is from a nurse at Site D who really talked about the culture. Our culture, I think, at Site D, we hold our physicians accountable to doing a good job for patient care, but beyond that, there's just not a lot of accountability or incentives for being involved in these extracurricular things that make the workplace better. They liked their flow and they liked their silo working. That worked for them. They didn't want to change. So just kind of culturally and historically, um, the group just didn't see quality improvement and, and things like reset as, as something they would focus their efforts on. Also important was site leaders' engagement in reset and their relationship with one another. So on a positive note, physician mentor, again, talking about site C, which did a great job, said the site leaders really listened to the feedback that we were giving them and they would come prepared to all the meetings with questions. Every meeting, the physician leader and the nurse leader came to it together. They were in the same room together. They had a great relationship that helped them to roll out the interventions on these sites. So again, uh, at each of these sites, they had a physician leader, a nurse leader leading implementation at this site. Both of them were very effective leaders individually and together they worked really well. Contrast that with this comment from the chief medical officer at site B who said the site physician leader has wavered in his support of it back and forth of reset. It's not just been reset, he's wavered in his support of a lot of things here and I love him. He's a good friend and a, just a great, great physician and a great guy, but his leadership in this area has waxed and waned. And this was true for two of the sites where the physician leader really never uh, was, was ambivalent at best about reset. And that was really important um, in, in kind of not getting the rest of the, the physicians on board with some of these changes. And that leads me to the last factor. Again, there was variation in frontline buy-in and perceptions of benefit. And what I mean by that is that physicians generally, nurses generally felt that there was a need to improve teamwork and saw the benefit of reset and the AIMS interventions where physicians wondered whether there was a need and wondered whether there was any benefit to these interventions. And you can see that in the quotes, a quote from site D nurse who said that the nurses really appreciated being involved in the rounds and the doctors and the interdisciplinary team members because often the doctors meet with the case manager and have one plan but they won't really communicate back to the nurses and they've, they're often the last ones to know. So it really helps to have better communication. The nurses really saw the benefit. Contrast that with this comment from the physician mentor talking about site D, who said the physician group was really like, why are we being asked to do this? So reset from the start was from the physician perspective, a solution without a problem. And I think part of what the site leaders tried to do and had some success with was to say, our outcomes aren't as good as they could be and here's a way that can help us improve, but it just never got huge traction. And that was pretty common that the, the physicians were kind of wondering you know, why they were doing this and didn't really see the need or the benefit. So what should hospitals do? What, what should your hospital do? <clears throat> well, I think that going back to those four factors that I identified, that we identified our team, I think there are some important questions that, that you might ask yourself and, and other hospitals who are thinking about implementing things like this should ask themselves, is the senior leadership team willing to provide tangible support? Are they willing to not just have a kind of a cursory knowledge and involvement, but really willing to get involved if and when problems and disagreements occur to help resolve them? Second, are the priorities of the hospital, the hospital's group and the residency aligned? I didn't mention it, but two of the, these sites had residency programs. One residency was openly opposed. Another one was was open to changes, but the residency program obviously is a key stakeholder. Are there committed nurse and physician leaders, talented ones who work well together and are willing to lead these efforts? I do think that the best implementation strategy is a dyad kind of nurse and physician team. 
And then lastly, do hospitalists see the potential to change systems or how can we illuminate the need to change systems for hospitalists and are they willing to change their workflow to improve teamwork? Here are some additional kind of uh, high level recommendations. I think it's a great idea to start out by assessing teamwork and collaboration to determine baseline uh, performance and make a case for change. You can do that easily with the surveys that I described earlier. It's also a good idea to ensure strong, engaged leadership at all levels. As I've mentioned, um, those project leaders should assemble a project team with representatives from bed assignment, nursing, hospital medicine, residency, all of the, the key stakeholders, perhaps emergency medicine as well. It's a good idea to partner with quality and performance improvement. I think you guys have a department like this. We do too. Performance improvement leaders often have great project management skills that can help us also a different perspective, which can be very helpful. It's a great idea to collect some fidelity measures because often we think implementation is going well, but unless we actually have some measures showing it, um, so we can kind of fool ourselves. And then finally provide training and coaching for interprofessional rounds. Once we get people in the same room at the same time doing rounds, we wanna make sure that those conversations are really, um, really helpful and high quality. So in conclusion, teamwork is essential for safe and effective care. Changing how people relate to one another and improving teamwork requires changing the system. It's important to confirm the organization is ready for change and to be clear about what you're trying to achieve. And it's important to keep at it. Most hospitals don't have success unless they've tried this two or three times. And sometimes it very much depends on timing. I've worked with a lot of great people uh, on this work. So I wanna just thank them, especially Mark, who, who I mentioned has been my mentor for many years. And there's many others that we've collaborated with. And again, I really thank you for the opportunity to share this. I hope that some of it was useful for you. We've got a good amount of time, so I'd love to take some questions. Go ahead. Yeah, that is a great question. So just to kind of recap and, and talk about some of the concepts that you introduced, you, you were mentioning that, understandably, there, there's turnover among physicians, right? And we rotate from, from service to service. And lately, especially, there's been a lot of turnover in nurses and, and other staff uh, and healthcare professionals in the hospital. And so what you bring up is kind of, you, you know, underneath this is, um, the concept that building relationships improves communication and improves teamwork. And there's really, I think, two ways to think about the relationship. There's the relationship on any given day, and then there's the relationship over time. And so I, I'm not aware of any evidence that's looked at uh, building relationships over time where you know physicians are on the same unit over and over again so that they build up relationships with the nurses who generally, at least historically, have, have been on the same unit for some length of time. Um, but I think that's okay. I think that even on any given day, you know, you, you, for a complicated patient, you may talk to the same nurse, you know, over and over again. And if you're, if you know her face and her name or his name and his, his face, even on that day, I think that's beneficial. So, um, so yeah, and, and one of the things that we found in our study, one of the points of resistance on the part of physicians 
was this kind of misunderstanding of what we're trying to accomplish. And many of them saying, I, I don't want, I want a variety of patients and I don't want all my patients on one unit because I like to, you know, go from unit to unit and work with different people and maybe the patients on this unit are a little bit different than that one. And what we tried to convince them is that's okay over time, you're gonna rotate on these different units, but we're just asking that if you're on for a week, you're on that unit for the week and you're still gonna get some variety, but it's gonna be variety over time. And even if you're just on that unit throughout the week, you're gonna have a better relationship even if it's just in a shorter period of time than rotating on the same unit over and over again, over weeks to months. I don't know if that makes sense. I, I, did I address uh, some of the things that you brought up? Okay, great, thank you. Dr. Frazier. That was a great talk, thank you so much. So given that most of us are wearing masks in clinical situations all the time, and we do get a uh, high turnover of, of nursing staff with the lack of presence, do you have any recommendations for how you can improve either teamwork, communication, and, um, yeah. and focus when people are masked and when they have these highly flexible teams? Yeah. That is a great question. And it, it reminds me of an issue that, that we've seen that you guys probably have seen too, where in our interprofessional rounds, we, we have a group of people get together and there's, you know, at the table, there's the physician and who's coming in usually in a staggered fashion. There's the nurses, there's the charge nurse, uh, the social worker, the pharmacist. It's really hard to know who's who. And then as we, the, usually the physician starts out and saying, okay, my next patient is John Smith. And, um, and so even before masks, one of the things that we tried to get um, our nurses to do pretty consistently was to identify themselves. So when the physician said, my next patient is John Smith, the nurse taking care of John Smith would say, I've got John Smith today. Uh, my name is Sarah. And so now the physician knows to not just kind of like be, you know, looking in the room, wondering, you know, they can look at the nurse and, you know, eye to eye, talk to them. But with the masks, it's really hard. Sometimes you can't tell in a closed space, like who, who said that? <laughs> so we asked them to raise their hand and, and, and just kind of physically make sure we know where, who spoke up. And, and it's really like this very simple, but um, really a big problem. So yeah, thank you for bringing that up. That's the little practical tip that, that we've had is just kind of both, you know, saying who's taking care of the patient and then making sure that we do something to make it obvious. Uh, in light of the fact that you can't see people's mouths. It's a big challenge, right? Because as you've seen, you know, the evidence isn't really, really compelling. It's kind of mixed. And it's, it's hard to make the case that, well, it, it depends because, you know, often we haven't really fully optimally implemented this. But um, so I think that that baseline data can help. You know, I think that all physicians want to communicate effectively and, and want to be good team members. And, and that the, the barrier to doing a better job is not um, because anybody's philosophically opposed to it. It's just these systems issues. So if we can convince physicians that there is an issue and we do care about the nurse's perspective and that there is this data to support an association between outcomes and nurses' uh, perceptions of collaboration, then we just, have to be realistic about what changes we can make and take the time to engage physicians and everyone else whose workflow is going to be changed and make some compromises, right? I mean, so we may have one change in mind, but then when we talk to a group and understand their workflow, realize that, you know, maybe we can't do as much as what we thought, or maybe we need to do something a little bit different. Um, Really, the implementation is key. I think the earlier you get all the people who represent the front line involved and really have an open discussion about workflows, look, what workflows look like and what changes are realistic and meaningful and what's, what's not realistic, I think that 
if people see that we're partnering and flexible, I think, you know, they'll get on board. Yeah, thank you. That's, that's a great question. It is, so there's a bunch of little related constructs that are distinct, and I did kind of mesh them all together. Um, so to answer your question for the survey, we, we don't define collaboration. We really just leave it up to the individual to, uh, to, to define that um, in, in what I showed you. We also use something called the safety attitudes questionnaire, which has a safety domain and a teamwork domain. So you're nodding your head, so you may be familiar with this, but it's a validated instrument that's got constructs within it that represent these components of teamwork. Um, I didn't show you that because it's not as pretty, the results, but we show an improvement in teamwork climate as well. So um, yeah, that's a really important question. All of these things are related. You know, the more we improve the relationship, which, you know, how do you measure that? The more collaboration and teamwork improve, but all of these are related, but slightly distinct concepts. Um, they do group pretty well together. And so, like I said, we've shown both an improvement in collaboration as perceived by the people responding to the survey, and then also teamwork climate, which is a much more validated. Rob? Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, that's great. And so you're talking about the first slide, the the suboptimal one, or the yeah, yeah gotcha. Yeah, that's a great. Let's collaborate. That's a great study. I love that. Um, we, I, I was wondering, and I should have asked you guys yesterday if you have text messaging. So you use Secure Chat, which is like Epic Secure Chat. Yeah, and I mean, there's a whole body of research that needs to be done on technology and, and there's a lot that has been done but technology is is changing pretty rapidly and um, and I don't think we know the full effect of it so yeah that's really interesting because we don't have that effectively implemented at Northwestern and to hear you say that uh, we've got this technology and yet um, it, it isn't improving the ability to be clear and, and close loop that's that's fascinating I don't know of anybody who's looked at that I think that's an opportunity So one of the things that I was talking to Dana um, back when we were doing these views was I had the observation that the unit is the physical unit itself didn't fit like the process. It's just like there was too many beds. So then you have to share two beds or yeah. like sitting together to talk. And, and so the key construct was actually affected by the physical unit, uh, by the physical unit characteristics. So isn't that the same that you said? Yeah. Um, in, in reset in our hospital as well, when I talk to others, yeah, it, you know, this is, it kind of forces people into kind of this modular thinking about staffing, right? So you, you have to, um, but I think it gets better over time because I think the leaders who are making these decisions kind of realize there's a benefit to this and then may make decisions about kind of staffing allocation and, and unit allocation. Uh, to help support, uh, you know, localization and and um, and these related interventions. So, for example, our pharmacists historically have supported two units. So our units are thirty bed units, and um, so you know, before we started all this, they had 
an assigned number of patients that was about 60 patients. And then when we started doing this, we had to do the math and say, okay, well, you're covering about 60 patients anyway. We've got, you know, 30 patients per unit. Can you cover these two units? And by the way, um, we'll stagger the timing of SIDR so that you can attend both of them. And, and we did this. The only way we knew how to do this was that we had them at the table in the design phase so that we understood everyone's workflow and said, okay, well, if you're supporting 13 West and 13 East, we'll start 13 East at 10, 15 and 13 West at 11, because that'll give you enough time to finish on one unit and then come to the next. Um, same with you know, other social workers, physical therapy, you know, just over time, they've tried to build in the desire to attend interprofessional rounds with the way they assign their professionals uh, to units and to patients. But as you said, the math, you know, it's never quite right. So, you know, you have to try to be as flexible as possible. I thought there was another question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, the, the space is, uh, is really important. We're fortunate that we have, we, we do it in a conference room and we're fortunate that the conference room is big enough, barely big enough, um, and it's also on the unit so people don't have to travel too far. We did a, um, <laughs> so I, once when we published this, um, as, as you may know, there's some people are really, really passionate about doing rounds at the bedside. And I think that's a great idea too. It's just logistically kind of challenging. And so I got a call from, I won't tell you who, but some, you know, some leaders kind of in the country who, uh, you know, are zealots and of this and, you know, almost like chewed me out for not like, you know, doing this at the bedside. And, and some of our leaders wanted to do that. I felt like it was important to try. Um, so we did eventually do what we called patient-centered bedside rounds. We had patients help us design the intervention. Um, we had our patient family advisory council involved. And what we found was implementation was really hard. We didn't see an improvement in patient satisfaction, shared decision-making, comprehension of the plan. All that said, implementation was really hard. So I'm not you know, I'm not convinced that that's not a, uh, you know, useful. I just think that it's another layer of difficulty with implementation. So, um, yeah, and if you did that with uh, a room that was shared with another patient, that might present another challenge, right? So, I, I don't know if I answered your question. I, I, I think all of these things are, um, make sense. They have face validity, but um, they add additional layers of, of difficulty in implementation. Yep. Thank you.